Here's a quick question for you. How many books are in the Bible? 66, 73, 75, 81. And before I answer that question, we need to take a quick trip downtown so that I can make an analogy to explain this. So let's take a trip, hop on my bike, and off we go. How many books are in the Bible? 66, 71, 73, 75, or 81? If you picked any of the above answers, you were correct. And I'm gonna explain why in this video. To answer that question is a long and complicated history. And that's what we're gonna go into in this video and why I brought you down here to the Pioneers Museum or the old city county building for Colorado Springs. The challenge we face answering that question is we stand at the very end of a long historical process. Open up any Bible and you'll see your table of contents and which books are in and which books are out. But it hasn't always been that way. It's a lot like looking at a finished building. The structure's all there, it's complete, it's done. But it took a lot of work and several processes to get it to that stage. The same thing with the Bible. The Bibles we have now are like this complete building but we need to know how they were quarried, chosen, assembled, and put into the final form in order for us to understand what we mean by the canon of the Bible. To explain this analogy from history, we're gonna start here at the museum, but we need to go all the way up over there to the base of Pikes Peak to see how it got here. These are the old stone steps that the stonemasons carved for getting the stones out of this quarry and down to Colorado Springs. Think of this quarry as sort of the writings of the early church fathers. They would have quarried material from the life of Christ, the Old Testament, and from that wrote the books of the Bible. The early church would have then selected among the various books that were taken out of this quarry for what they saw as profitable for teaching within the church. And through time, that became part of the Bible. Enough local history. We need to get back to the office and look at how the canon was formed. In order to answer this question about the canon, I'm gonna break this into two videos because I don't think I can do justice to this idea in one video and number two, I don't want to bore you to tears with one incredibly long video and you're just going, man, this guy just rolls on and on and on. The challenge we face in defining the canon, the books that we have within our Bible or not, is a really long and complicated story. And we stand at the very end of that process. Allow me to clump, and that's a highly technical theological term for those of you who are interested, the history of the biblical canon into a few major time periods for the sake of explaining this. I want to start with the formation of the Jewish canon, then the period of the collection of the early church, what I would call the quarry, then the 1,000 year period of Jerome's Vulgate, the Reformation, and then the modern era. So to start with, the formation of the Hebrew scriptures or the Hebrew canon. Within many branches of Judaism, the Masoretic text is considered the canonical text within Judaism. This version of the Hebrew scriptures is known for its vowels and the pointing that it has within the text. The original Hebrew text only had consonants, no vowels. The Masoretes added the vowels and the pointing to help people read it and to understand how it should be vocalized when they read it. We also need to realize that the Masoretic text really came into formation during the medieval period, let's say around 1000 AD. But if we back up before that, we see that there's sort of about a 600 year period 
when the scriptures of the Old Testament are collected together and gathered. The Torah, or the first five books of the Bible, were seen as authoritative by around 400 BC. The prophets, somewhere around 200 BC, and the writings around 100 to 200 AD. The discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls revealed how the Jewish canon was in flux even up to around 70 AD. For example, the teachers at Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls came from, viewed the books of Enoch and Jubilees as authoritative texts in their writings, books that did not make it into the Hebrew Bible. You'll often hear people talk about that the decision for what books were included in the Hebrew Bible were made at the Council of Jamnia around 70 AD. This idea was first put forward by a guy named Heinrich Gratz in Germany around 1870 and has been passed around ever since then down to our day. I think most Old Testament scholars today no longer consider that the Hebrew scriptures were formed at the Council of Jamnia and it's just not a plausible view. Gratz developed his idea from a reference in the Talmud, which was written around 4 to 600 AD, that says Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai was given permission by the Romans to relocate from Jerusalem to Jamni around 70 AD, where he founded a school to teach the Jewish law. Gratz developed three major trajectories off this reference in the Talmud. The first is that a council occurred at Jamni in 70 AD, but that's not in the Talmud. Second, that the Jewish communities formally adopted the Hebrew version of the Old Testament, not the Greek Septuagint at that time. And third, that anyone who confessed the name of Jesus of Nazareth should be shunned by the Jewish community. It's not that the Hebrew canon wasn't solidified somewhere around 100 to 200 AD. It's just that it probably didn't occur at this council in Jamnia. It's a nice, neat explanation for why the Jewish communities adopted what would become the Masoretic text, while the Christian church went a different direction and a list of books with the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint. He also used this idea to explain how the split between the synagogue and the church took place. Leaving the hypothetical Council of Jamnia behind, by 200 to 400 AD, the Jewish community had more or less settled on the 39 books of the Hebrew Bible that is similar to the Protestant list of books as well. Let's turn our attention now to what takes place within the church. And we're gonna look at the earliest collections which take place around 100 AD up to around 313 AD when you have the Edict of Constantine and the church becomes an officially recognized religion within the Roman Empire. From 100 to 200 AD, the early church used the Greek version of the Hebrew Bible, or what we call the Septuagint. This raised an interesting paradox. On the one hand, they generally followed the Jewish community's view of what compromised the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. On the other hand, the Septuagint contained more books than the Hebrew Bible, like 1st and 2nd Maccabees, Tobit, Judith, and others. As a result, the early church wrestled with whether they should use the Hebrew or the Greek version. In the end, they decided to follow the Greek, the Septuagint, because the authors of the New Testament quoted from the Greek version the vast majority of time, and they were more familiar with Greek than Hebrew. Which books are included in the New Testament is a much fuzzier story, though. Oftentimes, they would cite from the various books and letters that make up the New Testament, for example, 1st Clement, around 80 AD, quotes from almost all of Paul's main letters. But these early church fathers really didn't define which books were in or out. In the sermons and the writings of the early church fathers, we can see what texts they considered authoritative. For example, Irenaeus and Ignatius quoted from almost all of Paul's letters as authoritative for their churches around 150 AD. The other thing that takes place is they begin to collect various books into small codexes, or what we call books, not scrolls. Probably as teachers traveled from one city or church to another, they would copy the books and letters that that church had there and then bring them back to theirs. Around 160 AD, one of the church fathers, a guy named Tatian, attempted to combine all four gospels into one account, the Dia Tesseron. Others collected the four Gospels into one codex, so you would have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in one small book. 
A very influential teacher during this time named Marcion collected 10 of Paul's letters and Luke's gospel into one codex. His mini canon had a huge impact on the early church. Unfortunately, Marcion was very anti-Semitic. He edited Paul's letters to remove any positive reference or comments about Judaism, and he cut out many quotes from the Old Testament, and he dismissed the value of the Hebrew scriptures for the church. Fortunately, the church realized the radical nature of his teachings and judged him to be a heretic. However, it forced them to consider what books we should collect. The challenges that the church faced during this time, criticism from outside and heretics from within, really forced them to begin to ask questions about which texts they should consider authoritative. Origen, who lived from 180 to let's say 250 AD, was one of the greatest biblical scholars during his day, and even down to today, I would argue. He examined the Old and the New Testament in their original languages. He also compiled an edition of the Old Testament in six languages, side by side, the Hexapola. He wrote extensive commentaries on the New Testament as well. Now, Origen accepted the Gospels, Paul's letters, Hebrews, 1 Peter, 1 John, and Jude as authoritative. But before you get too excited, he also included the Epistle of Barnabas, the Shepherd of Hermes, the Didache, and the Gospel of Hebrews. But James, 2 and 3 John, and 2 Peter were out. In fact, he thought 2 Peter was an outright forgery and rejected it. Elsewhere in the church, the letters of Hebrews, James, John, and Peter's letters were the last to be accepted widely as well. Questions about what books make up the New Testament, what books are authoritative and should be read from and taught within the churches, takes a major turn in 313 AD with Constantine's edict. After Constantine makes this edict, the church is now recognized as an official religion. It can work out in the open and it no longer has to work behind closed doors. Eusebius, who lived during this time, was a bishop in Syria and he had a very, very close relationship with the emperor. Emperor Constantine commissioned him to produce 50 high quality Bibles in 331 AD. As a bishop, Eusebius had started a school that trained copyists at his church, what we call a scriptorium. So he was an ideal candidate for the job. Some textual scholars think that Codex Vaticanus or Codex Sinaiticus, which I have a copy of one of the pages hanging up back there, are examples of the Bibles that Eusebius produced for Constantine. They may not be the exact Bibles that Eusebius produced, but they reflect the layout and the style that Eusebius used. Shortly after Eusebius' commission, let's say about 20 years later, Athanasius, who was a bishop down in Egypt, wrote an Easter letter to all of his churches in 366. In his letter, he mentions the 27 books that are included in the New Testament today as, quote, the only source of salvation and authentic teaching. At the same time, he also includes Baruch and the letter of Jeremiah in the Old Testament. At the Council of Laodicea in 360 AD, all of the books in the New Testament that we have today are mentioned except for Revelation. As a side note, Revelation had a very difficult time being accepted into the canon because the early church thought it led to anti-imperial ideas and could lead to members of their churches taking up arms against the government. It wasn't until Augustine comes along in the 4th century that he taught that we should interpret Revelation as an allegorical text about the struggle between good and evil. As a result, the hesitations that the early church had about this book were laid. And I'll have a link to the video that I have on that over here. The councils of Carthage in 397 and 419 listed all the 66 books that we have in the Protestant Bible today and said that these were to be read and taught within the church. What's interesting is that the decisions that were made at the Council of Carthage did not prove to be definitive. The argument continued. So what can we say about the sort of the first 300 years of the church in relationship to the formation of the canon, especially in regards to the New Testament? First, this was a very slow process. Some books were considered core to this collection and widely recognized fairly early. The Gospels and Paul's longer letters, for example. However, even by four to 500 AD, 
we have numerous biblical manuscripts that include non-canonical writings in their collection. The Didache, Clement's Letters, Judith or Tobit in the Old Testament. So you can see that it's kind of in flux. And we need to remember that a lot of these Bibles, for example, Vaticanus or Sinaiticus, these Bibles I'm talking about, were produced within churches that were sponsored by bishops. So these were seen as authoritative within those churches. This isn't something that's being done by one individual in a back room. What about the Gnostic Gospels, for example? Well, it appears that around 200 to 300 AD, we have a number of Gnostic Gospels that appear in Egypt during this time. These include the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Judas. These books were seen as authoritative within certain areas of the church along the Nile River. They weren't widely recognized. Other church fathers knew about them and condemned them as being heretical. They were never widely accepted. And so the influence and the impact of these Gnostic Gospels was very limited in geography and period of time. But that doesn't mean they're not important to know. In fact, I think these texts are really crucial to help us understand how the early church exegeted and interpreted the life of Christ. But that's a story for another day. Let's get back to my summary statement here. I think we can say that there was a core of accepted books during this time, while at the same time there were other books that certain church fathers in certain areas said that we should read from and teach from, sort of a penumbra of other books that were recognized during that day. Penumbra, did that word just slip by you? What is a penumbra? A penumbra is the edges of a shadow. It comes from the Latin penne, which means almost an umbra, shadow. It's a good visual illustration of what I'm talking about here. The core books that were recognized is the dark central region of that shadow. But as we move further out into the edges of the shadow, it transitions from dark shadow to light. Today, we tend to see the edges of that shadow or the cannon as fairly sharp. But during that day, it was very fuzzy on its edges. And depending on where you were, decided which books were included in that penumbra of the shadow. This brings us to Jerome and the Latin Vulgate. In 382, Jerome was commissioned by his bishop to translate the Bible into Latin. Now, it's difficult to overstate just how influential the Vulgate has been upon the church and the canon in particular. Jerome included the 66 books that make up what we call the Protestant Bible today in our present order. However, his bishop insisted that he include the Old Testament apocryphal works as well. In a compromise, Jerome included the Apocrypha, but included a preface at the start of each book. For the books of the Apocrypha, he basically said that many in the church find these useful for teaching and spiritual growth, but they were not on the same level as the other books within the Bible. And if you're wondering what Apocrypha is, you can pick up one today on Amazon. Basically, these are the books that the Catholic Church recognizes, but the Protestants don't. They're very, very useful for understanding the New Testament thought, and in some cases, you can actually see where they get quotes from in the New Testament. Before we continue with the impact of Jerome's Vulgate upon the development of the canon, we need to realize that the Greek and the Eastern Orthodox churches developed their own version of the canon, and to a large extent, they traced the development of this back to Eusebius' Greek edition, not Jerome's Vulgate. Now, the differences between, for example, Anglican, Protestant, Catholic, and the Eastern Orthodox churches is primarily in which books they consider part of the Old Testament. The New Testament is pretty locked down. In fact, by around 500 AD, there's not a great deal of argument over the New Testament. But which books were included in the Old Testament was a debate that continued all the way up to the Great Schism in 1054 AD between the Western and the Eastern churches. The table of contents in the NRSV version of the Apocrypha is very, very useful because it shows you right at the very start the books that the Catholic Church considers as part of its canon, and then those that are included as well by the Eastern Orthodox and the Greek Orthodox churches, and then even the Slavonic churches. Now, one of the reasons why the Greek and the Eastern Orthodox churches include more books in the Bible than, for example, the Catholic or the Protestants is they take a much more flexible approach towards the canon. 
In the West, we really see these as having been defined at the Reformation or the Counter-Reformation. In the Eastern Orthodox Church, they look at these books as what are useful for being read during the Divine Liturgy. For example, with the Book of Revelation, they don't read from that during the Liturgy, so they may not consider it canonical, but they would still consider it to be divinely inspired and morally binding. So where does this bring us at the end of our first video here? Well, in the West, Jerome's Vulgate is seen as the definitive Bible and it will be that way for over a thousand years. Talk about a lasting impact. The second thing I want to bring out is that the idea of the canon, what the church recognizes as authoritative and inspired text to be read and taught within the churches is something that develops over time. We don't have one moment in time where this decision is made, but it is made over time. Even by the time we hit Jerome's Vulgate around 400 to 500 AD, the decisions are not squarely laid out. And we're going to see when we come up to the Reformation how this really brings about a much more sharpening and divisive picture of what the canon is. But we're going to save that till next week. Until then, peace. peace.